Hello, my name is Harmeet Malik and I'm an evolutionary geneticist uh, studying the evolution of viruses and host genomes at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Today I'm actually going to tell you about molecular arms races between primate and viral genomes and how we aim to understand the evolutionary rules that take place between these viruses and hosts and what that will tell us about not just the evolution of ourselves and viruses, but also to design therapeutic interventions to allow us to design better strategies that are going to be effective against viruses. The work in the uh, field of molecular arms race is really inspired by the character, the Red Queen, that was introduced to us by Lewis Carroll in his book Through the Looking Glass. And the Red Queen uh, tells Alice in this uh, sort of uh, nice book that it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. Very much the same idea was adopted by the evolutionary biologist Lee Van Whalen as the Red Queen hypothesis. And he argued that in a system where two entities are constantly competing with each other in this sort of battle for evolutionary supremacy, the only way for this battle to be resolved is just for one party to temporarily win before the other party catches up. And this requires both of these parties to be really running as fast as they can with this very rapid evolutionary signature formalized as the Red Queen hypothesis that's been used to invoke all kinds of very important principles in evolutionary biology, including the existence of sex uh, and why we actually evolved to be sexual creatures in the first place. So if you consider a host-virus interaction, this is an interaction that screams out genetic conflict. This is what we refer to as the usual suspects. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to understand that what is in the best interest of the virus will not always be in the best interest of the host. So in this cartoon example, you can see that we've got two states uh, described here. You've got the host uh, that is binding the virus on one side, and the virus that has evolved a mutation to evolve away from that recognition by the host immune system. What you'll actually under appreciate is that these state transitions between one state and the other are really profound but very simple from a mechanistic standpoint. What it might take is just a single amino acid mutation for the virus to gain one step ahead in this battle for Levrushi supremacy. So the important take home message from this kind of slide is one party is always losing this high stakes evolutionary battle. On the left hand side you can see that the host is winning because it is recognizing a viral protein. On the right hand side you can see that the host is losing because the virus has acquired the right mutation that allows it to evade detection by the immune system which basically means that there's never going to be a perfect equilibrium between these two states. Over the course of evolution and even the course of a single infection in a person the immune system and the virus are basically be locked in this arms race of very rapid evolution. And because one party is always losing, there's always going to be an evolutionary advantage to be gained by innovation. Now we're going to actually talk about two types of innovation today. In the first part of my talk, which is focused exclusively on how hosts evolve in the face of viral challenges, we're going to uh, specify innovation in protein coding genes. And so if you consider what a protein coding gene arbitrarily looks like, um, it's, it's this sort of sequence that I've indicated here where we've got three triplets, three codons that specify three amino acids that will be incorporated into the protein that is produced from this gene. Now you can see on this side, you have a mutation that does not alter the amino acid being encoded. We refer to these as silent or synonymous changes because from a very sort of rough approximation, natural selection is really acting on the protein coding sequences. And here, because the protein coding sequence has not altered, we refer to these as silent or synonymous changes. In contrast, you can see here, we have again a single amino acid mutation which is uh, altered one of the amino acids that's being encoded, so-called non-synonymous or replacement changes. Now, both of these are sort of equal likelihood mutations. You can actually have a synonymous mutation or a non-synonymous mutation. But you can appreciate that based on the genetic code, you're much more likely to see an amino acid altering mutation just if by random chance alone. So consider the uh, sort of situation where you actually had a gene, we refer to these as pseudogenes, that at some point in their evolutionary history encoded for a particular protein. Now, if you consider this gene now in its current degenerate form, let's say from the chimpanzee genome versus the human genome, and we were to just roughly calculate the number of synonymous changes versus replacement changes, 
we have to correct for the fact that there are many more possible replacement changes. So when you normalize for that correction, you will find that because this gene no longer codes for a protein, the rate of synonymous changes and the rate of replacement changes are roughly equal. And that's because selection has stopped worrying about this part of the genome in terms of its protein coding capacity. It has tolerated both mutations and they roughly go to fixation in a fairly random fashion. Now for most genes in the genome, you do care about the final product being produced, which is the amino acid sequence of the resulting protein. So here I have this hypothetical example where you have a protein coding gene that is basically represented in these triplets of codons, and what you'll see is there's a lot more blue changes or non-amino acid altering or silent changes. And very rarely do you see something which looks like a replacement or a, repla uh, a replacement or a non-synonymous change. The net result is that regardless of all of this change at the nucleotide level, the amino acid sequence remains Steve because Steve is really what is being selected for by evolution. Very rarely do you see a deviation from this optimal amino acid sequence. For instance, we can see sieve coming in in terms of this sort of grammar. The net result is not that we should infer that mutation has now stopped hitting the replacement sites. What we infer from this is because mutation has introduced changes in both replacement and synonymous positions, the fact that we don't see replacement changes over the course of evolution is an indication that natural selection acted upon these changes, deemed them deleterious, and removed them from the population before they had a chance to really spread uh, in the population, which means mutation is not really causing this bias between the blue and the red changes. It's actually natural selection, and more specifically, purifying selection that is acting to purify the population from these presumed deleterious mutations. The net result is if you were to now compare the rate of synonymous and replacement changes, you will find that the rate of replacement changes is actually much lower than synonymous changes, regardless of the fact that both of these changes were introduced in roughly the same proportion. My lab is actually interested in the other class of genes that emerges from these kinds of analysis. Here again, now we have a triplet code of sequences that encodes for my name in amino acid code. And what we will see when we compare across this sequence is that there are a lot more red changes than blue changes. In fact, a lot more red changes than what you'd expect, even by chance alone. It's in fact easier to align these sequences at the nucleotide level than it is to align them at the amino acid level, where my name can change to a popular car model very quickly because every mutation has a high likelihood of altering the amino acid being encoded. And this is exactly the signature we see when you have an interface that is precisely at the interface between a host and a virus conflict. And that's because every single one of these amino acid mutations is potentially beneficial and has, acted, uh, has been acted upon by natural selection to increase their rate of fixation in the population. Hence the term diversifying selection. In contrast to purifying selection, natural selection is increasing the amino acid diversity of these protein coding genes. As a result, what we have again is an apparent rate of replacement changes, Ka or Dn, which is increased over the apparent rate of synonymous changes. Once again, this is not a bias that is introduced by mutation. This is simply a different selective sieve that is acted upon by natural selection. This term, diversifying selection, is also referred to as positive selection or adaptive evolution. I'll use these terms interchangeably, and they're only different in the context of the tempo of which these changes happen. Now, if you were to take these characteristics of uh, replacement rates and synonymous rates and calculate them for all genes that we can compare between three sets of species, our own species genome, the rhesus macaque, or the chimpanzee genome, what we have is this very nice histogram which really reflects the selective constraints that have acted on all the protein coding genes within our genome. What you'll see is there's a large number of genes in the left-hand side of this histogram, which means for the bulk of the genes in the human genome, purifying selection or a dearth of replacement changes is really what is going on. We are very interested in this sort of small blip of genes right here, where you actually have a very small set of genes, which even at the whole gene level, have undergone much faster replacement changes, almost breaking the speed limit of evolution, if you will, to increase because of this diversity. And when you take a really close look at this category of genes, 
immunity genes are really overrepresented, as you might expect, because these genes have been acted upon repeatedly by natural selection. So we're going to consider a very specialized case of an arms race in, in today's seminar. And this arms race ensues when a viral protein begins to antagonize an antiviral protein. And in this example, the viral protein antagonism is going to force the antiviral protein to evolve to a state which this viral protein can no longer defeat, which will now force this viral protein to evolve rapidly in order to restore its antagonism. And this, in a, uh, in a microcosm, is one step of this arms race where both the host protein as well as the viral proteins have evolved in the subsequent arms race interaction. Actions. Now, what we're going to consider today is a specialized example of this antagonism where the viral protein that is being used to antagonize the host uh, antiviral protein is itself a host protein. So we are now basically considering how would the host be able to distinguish between an antagonism that is caused by a viral mimic versus its interaction with its own host proteins. And that's the problem we'd like to address today, which is how do host genomes confront and overcome, if they can, the challenge of pathogen mimicry. In today's seminar, we're going to focus on a very specific example of viral antagonism that is mediated by mimicry. And this example involves the host antiviral protein, protein kinase R. So protein kinase R is actually expressed when the organism senses it's under some sort of viral attack by virtue of an interferon detection pathway. But it's actually produced as an inactive monomer, which means it can no longer activate itself as a kinase, which is in the process of putting phosphate uh, moieties onto other proteins. However, if this particular cell happens to be infected by a virus, that is detected by the fact that there will now be double-stranded RNA in the cytoplasm, which should not be the case unless this cell was under viral attack. And what PKR will do is will use the signature of double-stranded RNA to dimerize and activate itself as a kinase, whose primary substrate is this protein EIF2-alpha, which stands for elongation initiation factor 2-alpha, which is a very important control step to initiate protein production through the ribosome. However, when PKR will phosphorylate EIF2-alpha, this essentially blocks protein production. So the cell's response to detect itself under viral attack is, I'm going to stop all protein production so that I do not become a virus production factory. This can be a very effective and a very potent block to viral production. And so what viruses have had to come up with is several clever means by which they can actually inhibit the PKR reaction. Some viruses, for instance, inhibit the dimerization of PKR. Some viruses will actually hide away all the double-stranded RNA they produce, whereas some viruses actually will encode a phosphatase that specifically takes out the phosphate residue that is put on by PKR. And perhaps the cleverest model comes from the hepatitis C viruses that actually allow PKR to block protein production, to essentially block all manner of host protein production, but will now nonetheless carry on their own protein production in an EIF2-alpha independent fashion, really highlighting the clever inventions that are really forced upon by virtue of these Darwinian arms races. In today's seminar, we're actually going to focus on only one of these antagonists, which is encoded by the pox viral uh, class of proteins, which include smallpox and vaccinia virus. And this is a protein called K3L, which acts as a competitive and non-competitive inhibitor, essentially breaking the interaction between PKR and EIF2-alpha, which basically allows the uh, virus to restore protein production and go on with its life cycle. So we actually started this by looking at what this arms race with the potential multiple antagonists from viruses has done to PKR evolution. And so to do this, we actually sequence the PKR gene from a panel of primates, which includes hominoids, including humans, great apes, as well as gibbons, old world monkeys, which includes things like rhesus macaques, and new world monkeys, which are primates that populate Central and South America. And when we do the sequence, we can actually reconstruct the evolutionary history of essentially every step and every codon across the PKR phylogeny. And so what we see in these numbers here are those DNDS or KAKS signatures that I talked about. When we have very low numbers, like this number 0.2 here, that's an indication of not very much happening at the protein evolution level. In contrast, we have some amazing examples like this lineage in old world monkeys, where we actually have 22 replacement changes 
without a single synonymous change happening. That's a really profound signal of multiple staccato replacement changes occurring in the course of evolution in a very, very short time frame, really highlighting the very intense and very episodic evolutionary pressures that have acted on PKR over the course of the last 35 million years of primate evolution. If we were now to sort of turn this around and squish it codon by codon, we essentially get a landscape of how PKR has been influenced by positive selection. All of these tick marks that I've shown above the PKR protein are individual codons that have recurrently evolved under positive selection. And you can see that in the case of PKR, these are really spread throughout the entire protein motif of PKR, including in the N-terminal domain, in this linker domain of the spacer region, as well as in the kinase domain, which actually carries out the very important step of EIF to alpha phosphorylation. Uh, and the reason we think that there's been such dramatic and such widespread positive selection is because multiple viruses actually antagonize completely different domains of PKR in order to mediate their antagonism of PKR. So what we're going to focus on today is just one of these antagonists, which is again these pox viral antagonists, K3L, that actually specifically antagonize the kinase domain of PKR. So the reason I've been spending so much time discussing K3L with you is because K3L is a special antagonist. It actually is a evolutionally derived and mimic which used to be EIF2 alpha, which means that at some point in pox viral evolution, pox virus actually stole EIF2 alpha from a mammalian host and have whittled it away to become this perfect mimic in order to break PKR's interaction with the EIF2 alpha substrate. Now what is really remarkable about this interaction is that it not just happened once in mammals, but it's happened on three separate occasions with three completely independent lineages of double standard DNA viruses, each of them acquiring a K3L-like mimic from their own version of EIF2 alpha. So this really highlights the very, very successful strategy of mimicry that is encoded by pathogens. And really, from an evolutionary standpoint, the strategy of mimicry and overcoming mimicry is a debate that's really been going on for a very, very long time, going back all the way to Henry Walter Bates, who really first detected uh, evidence for mimicry in these butterflies in the Amazon, where we have model butterflies that, that are basically poisonous, and so they're avoided, avoided by predators who can use their coloration patterns as an indication to, as a warning signal to stay away from them. And mimic butterflies that actually don't encode a poison at all, but take advantage of this coloration pattern and mimic the coloration pattern to take all the advantages of avoidance from predators without having to actually encode any of the toxins that are required. Now this is actually quite a really great strategy for the mimic. It's not so good for the model because as the mimics start increasing in frequency and the predators start eating more and more butterflies that look like this but are quite tasty, they will lose their avoidance of the predators, which means that the success of the mimic is directly inversely correlated with the success of the model. And very much the same thing might be going on at a molecular level, we feel, where EIF2 alpha is acting as a model protein, which is being mimicked by this pox viral mimic, K3L, in order to defeat the K, uh, PKR EIF2 alpha immunity response. So if you were to sort of rephrase the challenge of mimicry, it is that the PKR kinase domain needs to bind and maintain its interaction with EIF2 alpha while avoiding its interaction with the mimic, which really is evolutionally being selected to look like EIF2 alpha from the viral perspective. And you can see in this crystal structure that the structures of the PKR interaction domain between K3L and EIF2 alpha are almost completely super alignable. So how is it that PKR is able to acquire the ability to discriminate between these two. As I've already told you, one of the strategies that PKR is using is very rapid evolution. It's got that at its disposal. And this is just a sliding window plot of DNDS over the entire protein of PKR. And what you can see here is that there is not even a single domain where the DNDS signature drops below one, which means pretty much every domain of PKR is evolving under positive selection in this comparison between human and rhesus PKR. It's really remarkable how profound the signal is because when we compare PKR to its closest relative kinase, PERC, which is not involved in antiviral immunity, you can see that the signature is completely profound of purifying selection and not of positive selection. And this actually gets even more interesting when you look at EIF2 alpha, which is the substrate for PKR, because EIF2 alpha is 
so important for translation that it has not tolerated any amino acid changes over the course of evolution. You might be actually wondering where the red line went, and actually the red line is exactly on zero because no amino acid changes have occurred over the course of primate evolution. So in a way, you can view this as a very high stakes game of rock, paper, scissors, except EIF2 alpha is always playing rock. And so it would seem that mimic would have a very, very simple game, which is to mimic an unchanging protein and stay there. We wondered whether that was actually the case because first of all, we've actually survived pox viruses. And secondly, this suggested that PKR might have some adaptive routes in order to escape mimicry. Furthermore, if it was the case that K3L was simply evolving to an optimal mimic status, we might actually presume that K3L should now be under purifying selection, having optimized for this role in mimicry. Instead, what we actually find when we compare K3L from a, a panel of pox viruses is that very much like PKR shown here on the host side, which is very rapidly evolving, in contrast to EIF2 alpha, which is not, K3L happens to be one of the most fast evolving proteins in the pox viral genome. So this is truly an arms race between K3L and PKR. What makes this arms race really interesting is that they're both really evolving to get the attention of EIF2 alpha which is not changing at all. And so that's what makes the problem of mimicry really interesting from an evolutionary standpoint. So we wanted to actually have a system in which we could simply assay for the effects of mutations and evolutionary adaptations in a very facile assay. And we actually took advantage of an assay developed first by Tom Dever and Alan Hinnenbush who recognized that EIF2 alpha is so slow to evolve that if you actually put human PKR in yeast, it will actually bind and phosphorylate yeast EIF2 alpha to cause a growth arrest. Now in this context, if we now also introduce K3L, we have the situation where K3L can give you a readout of whether it's able to defeat PKR or not based on whether it can rescue the growth inhibition mediated by the PKR expression. So Nels Eldi, who is a postdoc in the lab, actually took this panel of PKR genes from a panel of uh, different primates, hominoids, old world monkeys, and new world monkeys, and he actually just put it into yeast cells. But he put it in a form which could not be turned on. So on, when these yeasts grow on glucose, because the PKR gene is put on a galactose promoter, it's silenced. And what you can see is that all of these yeasts grow perfectly fine. You can see that even in the serial dilution across, we basically have no growth inhibition. However, as soon as you turn on PKR by putting all of these yeast onto galactose plates, you can see no yeast being growing here, which means all of these PKR alleles have conserved the property of binding and phosphorylating yeast EIF2 alpha, which is remarkable considering the very large degree of evolutionary divergence that we've seen here. Now I can tell you that this is all because of EIF2 alpha phosphorylation because in this yeast, if I engineer a mutation in the phosphorylation side, all of the growth inhibition goes away and that's shown in these two panels here. So now the really interesting question happens when you introduce the viral antagonist. So what would you predict would happen here if you now introduce the K3L protein from a pox virus? In this case, we use the vaccinia virus. And what we find is a completely binary response. In some situations, like in the Gibbon PKR case, the introduction of the vaccinia K3L completely reverses the growth inhibition that is going on, whereas in the human case, even the presence of K3L at roughly equal levels of expression did not overcome the growth inhibition. So this is exactly like that cartoon example of those two states between hosts and viruses. And what we have is an evolutionary snapshot of both of those states where either the host is winning, in which case the growth inhibition goes on, or the virus is winning, in which case the growth inhibition is completely reversed. Now these are all assays being done in yeast, but we've actually done exactly the same types of assays in vaccinia cells, where we've actually taken either human cells or gibbon cells or orangutan cells and infected them with either a wild type fully functional vaccinia or something in which the K3L gene specifically had been deleted. And what you'll notice is that in human cells and orangutan cells, it actually doesn't matter whether you've deleted the K3L gene or not. And that's because these species actually have a PKR that's resistant to the K3L antagonism. Whereas in the Gibbon case, when you delete K3L, you have this tenfold drop in fitness, which basically is an indication that K3L from vaccinia is acting as a species-specific antagonist of the PKR response.
So we wondered whether we could actually gain better molecular insight into how is it that k is able to adopt these multiple states by looking at the co-crystal structure of PKR's kinase domain and the EIF2 alpha substrate, which was first actually established by Arvind Dar and Frank Sicheri's lab. And in this co-crystal structure, one of the most important motifs for this interaction happens to be this alpha helix that I've shown here as the G helix. This is effectively like a bird perch onto which PKR will sit, uh, on the bird perch on PKR onto which EIF2 alpha will sit down. If you take a closer look at this alpha helix shown here, there are three residues in particular that are making direct contacts with the backbone of EIF2 alpha. Now I'll remind you that EIF2 alpha is not changing at all. In fact, functionally equivalent between human and yeast. And yet, so you would predict actually that these three residues would be completely frozen in evolution by virtue of the fact that they have to interact with something that is completely frozen as itself. But instead what we find is that these three residues represent some of the fastest evolving residues in PKR's kinase domain. So the very sort of combination lock that is responsible for binding EIF2 alpha is the lock that is very rapidly changing. So somehow all of these combinations of residues at the alpha G helix have preserved the property of binding EIF2 alpha and yet are basically under very strong evolution. So we wondered whether this is in fact a, a signature of the fact that this is an interface that has been constantly challenged by viral mimicry. And so to test that, we again re return to our yeast assay. We have human PKR that is able to continue gro uh, growth inhibition even in the presence of K3L, given PKR that is completely reversed by the presence of K3L. And now in the given backbone, if we add single amino acid changes from human into Gibbon, what we find is that we can completely reverse the susceptibility phenotype into the resistant phenotype. So this really highlights two things. First of all, the interface between PKR and EIF12 is really a hot spot for positive selection. And individual residue changes, these single steps in the arms race between PKR and, and K3L result in a complete reversal from susceptibility to resistance. Now this also actually revealed to us something else that we uh, had missed earlier, which is even though the orangutan PKR is completely resistant to K3L mimicry, the orangutan G helix is not uh, resistant to mimicry, which means some other component of the PKR backbone in orangutan is actually necessary for mimicry, immediately suggesting that there was another solution to overcoming mimicry that was evident in orangutan. And we actually mapped that residue again to a single residue in this helix alpha E, very far away from this helix alpha G, which I've been telling you about today. And so very much like we saw in the human given uh, alpha G case, individual residue changes between gibbon and orangutan have the ability to switch from susceptible to resistant and resistant to susceptible. So again, really highlighting the very significant power of even individual mutations in individual residues. In the human uh, case, what we also sort of observed was this uh, particular residue is very interesting because it's actually toggled between leucine and phenylalanine throughout mammalian evolution, really reflecting the fact that there's probably a high degree of evolutionary constraint acting on this protein and yet it's toggling so as to keep one step ahead of this mimic interface. The human PKR actually has a very good helix alpha E residue as well as a helix alpha G residue, especially against vaccinia. And we actually have to mutate all three of these residues in order to convert the resistant human PKR into a susceptible version. So what have we learned from our examples of PKR overcoming the mimicry of K3L? The first really important le lesson we learned is that multiple domains of PKR need to be under rapid evolution in order to overcome mimicry. Again, as I pointed out, this is a rock, paper, scissors game. And if only one particular domain was under rapid evolution, K3L would have a much easier task antagonizing and mimicking this interface. The fact that multiple residues in multiple domains are actually rapidly evolving allows these domains to really take turns in antagonizing, overcoming the antagonism of K3L. And what appears to be the first evolutionary step when PKR encounters this mimicry is actually a negative affinity where PKR loses affinity not just to EIF2 alpha but also to K3L and then it restores its affinity by interactions in a, uh, another domain.
So this also implies that there must be extraordinary flexibility for PKR to basically recognize a substrate that really has undergone no changes over the course of evolution. So just as an example of this flexibility, here again we've got the orangutan G helix in a gibbon backbone, and you can see this is actually susceptible to mimicry. But you can see here now, because of the growth of this yeast colony, this is telling us that this particular chimeric version of PKR is also not doing a good job of recognizing its substrate. And yet the orangutan backbone has completely restored the binding to EIF2-alpha as well as overcome mimicry, which means something else in the orangutan backbone was sufficient to restore the weakness of its G helix over the course of these evolutionary arms races. So this is great, we've learned rules by which uh, PKR might actually overcome mimicry, but this is also sort of a sobering reminder that this overcoming of mimicry comes at a cost. So if you were to look at the alpha G helix from PKR and three other kinases whose primary substrate is EIF to alpha, we'll notice that PKR is the only kinase where we see this dramatic rapid evolution. We don't see it for these three other kinases, which means these kinases have had the evolutionary luxury to optimize to an optimal binding of EIF to alpha and essentially stay there, preserve their optimal binding by virtue of purifying selection. PKR no longer has that luxury because as it gets more and more optimal for EIF to alpha recognition, it gets more and more susceptible for K3L and antagonizing it as a mimic. So instead, PKR's evolutionary solution has been to back away from this optimal mimicry in order to gain more of this adaptive landscape that keeps it one step ahead of the virus in terms of these arms races. This is a very important sort of a consideration because it's not just antiviral genes that face mimicry. This is a slide in which we show that absolutely essential processes in the cell, the cytoskeleton, membrane trafficking, even the cell cycle and apoptosis, all absolutely fundamental housekeeping processes in the cell are all hijacked by some form of pathogen mimicry. It's worth considering that what are the evolutionary pressures that have been placed on all of these processes as they basically try to survive the mimicry imposed by the pathogen. And even though they've actually acquired really great adaptations to overcome this mimicry, some of these alleles might actually be compromised in terms of their housekeeping function for the function that they were originally intended for. And it's so it's not only the fact that the mimic is actually imposing evolutionary adaptation, it might be pushing some of these genes away from their optimal state for cellular function. So with that, I'm going to end this part of the talk. I'd like to really acknowledge Nels LD, who's a former postdoc in the lab, who has his own lab at the University of Utah now, and two very talented technicians, Emily Baker and Michael Eichbusch. And this work was done in collaboration with my colleague, Adam Jabal, and Stephanie Child in his lab really did all of the viral work that I discussed. I'd really like to thank our funding sources, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>